my back! You know, and his mother is sort of terrified of him because to discipline him is to engage in the possibility of a counter-revolutionary act. So he knows that he's got his parents where he wants them by this endless sort of young pioneers brigading sort of behaviour, you know? And it's a way of corralling the older generation into conformity. All those instincts for particularly left totalitarian forms of power, it's very acute here, considering that except for a small period in Spain, he'd never really been subjected to them. The other thing, which is very interesting, and which Orwell knew extraordinarily well, partly because of his time at the BBC, um, was the penchant intellectuals have for propaganda. Intellectuals adore the idea that they're independent spirits who are highly individualistic and always love game saying what anyone else has said to them. In actual fact, Orwell believed that most intellectuals are craven and deeply conformist and extraordinarily group oriented. And if you abstract the sort of politics, because he wrote BBC propaganda for India during the Second World War, and he wrote it in Senate House, which is in Mallet Street, where the Central London University buildings are, this sort of whitewashed, slightly authoritarian, sort of 20s, 30s type, sort of heavy modern building. And there's a room 101 in that, because all of the BBC offices had numbers. And the torture scene with O'Brien was the same room from which he broadcast anti-Axis propaganda to India, where, of course, Gandhian pacifism and the Indian National Army that supported the Axis and so on were active. And the BBC needed people to be in propaganda over to that part of the world during the Second World War. Now, there's an individual in this book called Sign, who's an etymologist. He's writing the 11th Dictionary of Ingsoc. And Sign meets uh, Winston Smith in the grubby canteen. Remember the food they have? It's like sort of, the, your lunch will be a Brillo pad, which is sort of pork or something, you know, surrounded with a sort of bloody stew, surrounded by bits of decaying vegetable, all in a broth, and you sort of eat it down with victory tea in a chipped mug. It's really hot because there's no milk in it, you know? And it's just sort of filth, really, but you've just got to sling it down because it keeps you going. And all the time, Simon's talking about the 11th Dictionary of Insult. He says, oh yes, he says, we're going to totally eradicate intellectual freedom of thought. This is an intellectual. He says, we're going to so restrict, methodologically, the linguistic compass of the human, so that people won't even be able to think independently of party rule. Because to be able to think, you have to have not just a concept, but the language to express it. We will so restrict language to um, the possibility that the signifier can never... Can never go beyond that which is signified. There will only be concrete concepts even for ideology so that the mind works in a totally binary way and you filtered out the prospect of chaos and thought criminality before you even uttered a word. And of course this is an intellectual who is devoted to the mind but finds in his own imprisonment and self-torture a strange pleasure. Orwell's realised that there's a penchant in many intellectuals to weave the bamboo of their own cage in ever more fascinating shapes. And it's this extraordinary precipitance in the way in which his own group behaves that gives the novel a particular power. Whether Syme's based on an academic called Syme, who wrote a famous book about Roman history in the 1930s, which was about the concept of Caesarism, I don't know. Or whether it's accidental. accidental. There are others, well, like Tillotson and various other party weavers and so on. There are great moments of illumination as they're biting into one of these meat sort of burgers, you know? And yet, look around you, just over there, the masses in a society like this will be eating meat that isn't meat. Don't you know that when you go to Kentucky Fried Chicken, that many of the trays contain food that isn't food? A lot of junk food is gas, is chemicals, has no food at all. There was an American television program a couple of years ago where they, you know, what Americans are like, a fifth of them are so obese, they could hardly fit through that door. I once saw a man in America who was so fat that I thought to myself, if you fired a bullet through his body, I had these thoughts, you know, if you fired a bullet through his body, you wouldn't hit a bone. Because he was so well fat. And that's because he spent his entire life eating that sort of muck eating that sort of muck, but it's the same muck as the party apparatchniks 
eat and say that they like it, in the canteen, in the Ministry of Truth. And Simon, you're sort of spitting out this grisly non-meat as he's talking, you know. Uh, these are probably imagined dinners in the BBC, sort of refiltered to a novelist imagination. And he's going, yes, it's marvellous, Winston. It's just marvellous insult. No freedom at all. The individual will be completely restructed and nerd. Imagine a baby with its limbs cut off, just quacking away ideologically. It's marvellous. He says, have another bit of chicken, you know. <laughs> because Simon is sold totally on the idea that his liberation is more and more enslavement, sort of anti-hermeneutically, to the minutiae of the party's lexicographical control of man. Now, to the non-intellectuals, to the mass of the population who were known as the proles, for whom the socialist revolution was created, of course, none of this matters at all. And all is extraordinarily aware of the ultimate class split, which isn't really about poverty, but is about the mind. This split between people who live for and use the mind and those who are purely physical. One of the slogans of people who want change in 94 is the future is the proles. They look at the proles and all of them to them in a degraded way. One of the things that socialists and left critiques, critics such as uh, Professor Raymond Williams, have always said about 1984 and related books is that they are degrading to working class people, that the attitude of bourgeois snobs in their ivory towers, liberals really, cracking on about theory, um, condemning those who are struggling for a better world. Williams, who was a sort of communist fellow traveller or crypto communist, from his birth at Oxford of course, you know, um, for many years, um, deep down had this view of Orwell and he expresses it in the Fontana Modern Masters uh, about Orwell. Interestingly, Fontana gave the Lenin volume to Robert Conquest, which is an absolute hatchet job, and they gave the Orwell volume to um, Williams, which is a mild hatchet job because the Orwell couldn't be criticised too much. Now, this desire for intellectuals to torment themselves and the di division between them and those who are purely physical in this life is one of the cardinal themes in 1984. There's a moment when, or when Winston and Orwell partly identifies with Winston, although it's not that absolute fit, obviously, but he invests a certain emotional power that clearly comes from himself within the narrative into the Winston figure. There's a moment when he looks out, I think it's during a scene when he's about to have sex, you can't really say love, with uh, Julia, um, his lover in the novel, and he looks out and he sees a proletarian washerwoman putting with some pegs and sort of laundry on a line, and she sings a love song. It was an opiate, an opiate, fancy, and all this. You know, it's a musical, it's a vaudeville term. And Winston looks out at her and says, if there's any hope, it lies with the proles. Now, one of the most interesting features, ideologically, in 1984, is that the party creates its own descent. The party creates its own past, it creates its own present, it creates its own future, because it controls the mind, the mental regime, that people use to think about the present, the past, and the future. And it also creates its own descent. All the dissenters use a book so called The Theory and Practice of Oligarchical Collectivism by Emmanuel Goldstein, who of course is Trotsky. And the two-minute hate is oriented towards Trotsky. The two-minute hate is very funny. In the ministry, all the chairs are lined up for the hate and you get like a sort of a, a, a performance or giving a speech in a company office, you know? There's a certain build-up of tension in the bureaucracy prior to the hate. You know, and they all sit in these rows, and there's, they're, all of the blocks are at war with each other, because there's Oceania, there's Eurasia, there's East Asia, three great totalitarian socialist regimes dominate the world, sort of North American, Latino bloc, European bloc, Asiatic bloc, and they just divide here, Africa and the rest of it, they're not even mentioned, the Africans, poor old Africans, <laughs> don't even get a mention. And initially, the hate begins with millions of Eurasian troops, you know, sort of the depiction of North Koreans or the Vietnam during the, those particular wars of American power, you know, faceless, merciless, Asiatic masses marching towards you, Tommy Gun out, all depersonalised and impersonal. And then, Trotsky's features will appear on the screen, and they all start hissing immediately. Uh, women, uncontrollable, have sort of negative orgasms, they roll about, throw things at the screen, beast, beast, they scream. And the hate's beginning, you see, and the party officials are pointing out the Goldstein figure. Because Goldstein wrote the book that defines the party's negation. But the inner trick is the party wrote that book. Yeah. Because they control the mind even of their enemies. And there's an amazing scene with O'Brien. Uh, in, the, in his ministry, where he's turned the TV set, he's turned the, he's turned the screen off, 
so they can't be listened to, and he's dressed in black, and Julia and uh, Winston